of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 118 It was late in the evening when Philip arrived at Fern. It was Mrs. Athelny's native village, and she had been accustomed from her childhood to pick up in the hop-field to which with her husband and children she still went every year. Like many Kentish folk, her family had gone out regularly, glad to earn a little money, but especially regarding the annual outing, looking forward to for months as the best of holidays. The work was not hard, it was done in common, in the open air, and for the children it was a long delightful picnic. Here the young men met the maidens. In the long evenings when work was over they wandered about the lanes making love and the hopping season was generally followed by weddings. They went out in carts with bedding, pots and pans, chairs and tables, and Fern, while the hopping lasted, was deserted. They were very exclusive and would have resented the intrusion of foreigners, as they called the people who came from London. They looked down upon them and feared them too. They were a rough lot, and the respectable country folk did not want to mix with them. In the old days the hoppers slept in barns, but ten years ago a row of huts had been erected at the side of a meadow, and the Athelnys, like many others, had the same hut every year. Athelny met Philip at the station in a cart he had borrowed from the public house at which he had got a room for Philip. It was a quarter of a mile from the hop field. They left his bag there and walked over to the meadow in which were the huts. They were nothing more than a long, low shed divided into rooms about twelve feet square. In front of each was a fire of sticks round which a family was grouped, eagerly watching the cooking of supper. The sea air and the sun had browned already the faces of Athelny's children. Mrs. Athelny seemed a different woman in her sunbonnet. You felt that the long years in the city had made no real difference to her. She was the countrywoman born and bred and you could see how much at home she found herself in the country. She was frying bacon and at the same time keeping an eye on the younger children, but she had a hearty handshake and a jolly smile for Philip. Athelny was enthusiastic over the delights of a rural existence. We're starved for sun and light in the cities we live in. It isn't life, it's a long imprisonment. Let us sell all we have, Betty, and take a farm in the country. I can see you in the country, she answered with good-humoured scorn. Why, the first rainy day we had in the winter you'd be crying for London. She turned to Philip. Athelny's always like this when we come down here. Country, I like that. Why, he don't know a Swede from a mangle wurzel. Daddy was lazy today, remarked Jane with the frankness which characterized her. He didn't fill one bin. I'm getting into practice, child and to-morrow I shall fill more bins than all of you put together. "'Come and eat your supper, children,' said Mrs. Athelny. "'Where's Sally?' "'Here I am, mother.' She stepped out of their little hut, and the flames of the wood-fire leaped up and cast sharp color upon her face. Of late Philip had only seen her in the trim frock she had taken to since she was at the dressmaker's, and there was something very charming in the print dress she wore now, loose and easy to work in. The sleeves were tucked up and showed her strong round arms. She, too, had a sunbonnet. "'You look like a milkmaid in a fairy story,' said Philip, as he shook hands with her. "'She's the belle of the hop-fields,' said Athelny. "'My word, if the squire's son sees you he'll make an offer of marriage before you can say Jack Robinson.' "'The squire hasn't got a son, father,' said Sally. She looked about for a place to sit down in, and Philip made room for her beside him. She looked wonderful in the night lit by wood fires. She was like some rural goddess, and you thought of those fresh, strong girls whom old Herrick had praised in exquisite numbers. The supper was simple, bread and butter, crisp bacon, tea for the children, and beer for Mr. and Mrs. Athelny and Philip. Athelny, eating hungrily, praised loudly all he ate. He flung words of scorn at Lucullus and piled invectives upon Bria Savaran. "'There's one thing you can say for you, Athelny,' said his wife. "'You do enjoy your food, and no mistake. "'Cooked by your hand, my Betty,' he said, stretching out an eloquent forefinger. Philip felt himself very comfortable. He looked happily at the line of fires, with people grouped about them, 
and the color of the flames against the night. At the end of the meadow was a line of great elms, and above the starry sky. The children talked and laughed, and Athelny, a child among them, made them roar by his tricks and fancies. "'They think a rare lot of Athelny down here,' said his wife. "'Why, Mrs. Bridges said to me, I don't know what we should do without Mr. Athelny now,' she said. "'He's always up to something. He's more like a schoolboy than the father of a family.' Sally sat in silence, but she attended to Philip's once in a thoughtful fashion that charmed him. It was pleasant to have her beside him, and now and then he glanced at her sunburned, healthy face. Once he caught her eyes, and she smiled quietly. When supper was over, Jane and a small brother were sent down to a brook that ran at the bottom of the meadow to fetch a pail of water for washing up. "'You children, show your Uncle Philip where we sleep, and then you must be thinking of going to bed.' Small hands seized Philip, and he was dragged towards the hut. He went in and struck a match. There was no furniture in it, and besides a tin box in which clothes were kept, there was nothing but the beds. There were three of them, one against each wall. Athelny followed Philip in and showed them proudly. "'That's the stuff to sleep on,' he cried. "'None of your spring mattresses and swans down. I never sleep so soundly anywhere as here. You will sleep between sheets. My dear fellow, I pity you from the bottom of my soul.' The beds consisted of a thick layer of hop-vine, on the top of which was a coating of straw, and this was covered with a blanket. After a day in the open air, with the aromatic scent of the hops all round them, the happy pickers slept like tops. By nine o'clock all was quiet in the meadow, and every one in bed but one or two men who still lingered in the public-house and would not come back till it was closed at ten. Athelny walked there with Philip, but before he went Mrs. Athelny said to him, "'We breakfast about a quarter to six, but I dare say you won't get up as early as that. You see, we have to set to work at six. "'Of course he must get up early,' cried Athelny, "'and he must work like the rest of us. He's got to earn his board. No work, no dinner, my lad. The children go down to bathe before breakfast, and they can give you a call on their way back. They pass the jolly sailor. If they'll wake me I'll come and bathe with them,' said Philip. Jane and Harold and Edward shouted with the delight at the prospect, and next morning Philip was awakened out of a sound sleep by their bursting into his room. The boys jumped on his bed, and he had to chase them out with his slippers. He put on a coat and a pair of trousers and went down. The day had only just broken, and there was a nip in the air, but the sky was cloudless and the sun was shining yellow. Sally, holding Connie's hand, was standing in the middle of the road with a towel and a bathing dress over her arm. He saw now that her sunbonnet was of the color of lavender, and against it her face, red and brown, was like an apple. She greeted him with her slow, sweet smile, and he noticed suddenly that her teeth were small and regular and very white. He wondered why they had never caught his attention before. "'I was for letting you sleep on,' she said, "'but they would go up and wake you. I said you didn't really want to come. Oh, yes, I did. They walked down the road and then cut across the marshes. That way it was under a mile to the sea. The water looked cold and gray, and Philip shivered at the sight of it, but the others tore off their clothes and ran in shouting. Sally did everything a little slowly, and she did not come into the water till all the rest were splashing round Philip. Swimming was his only accomplishment. He felt at home in the water, and soon he had them all imitating him as he played at being a porpoise and a drowning man and a fat lady afraid of wetting her hair. The bath was uproarious, and it was necessary for Sally to be very severe to induce them all to come out. "'You're as bad as any of them,' she said to Philip in her grave maternal way, which was at once comic and touching. "'They're not anything like so naughty when you're not here.' They walked back, Sally with her bright hair streaming over one shoulder and her sunbonnet in her hand, but when they got to the huts Mrs. Athelny had already started for the hop-garden. Athelny, in a pair of the oldest trousers anyone had ever worn, his jacket buttoned up to show he had no shirt on, and in a wide-brimmed soft hat was frying kippers over a fire of sticks. He was delighted with himself. He looked every inch a brigand. 
As soon as he saw the party he began to shout the witch's chorus from Macbeth over the odorous kippers. "'You mustn't dawdle over your breakfast or mother will be angry,' he said when they came up. And in a few minutes Harold and Jane, with pieces of bread and butter in their hands, they sauntered through the meadow into the hop-field. They were the last to leave. A hop-garden was one of the sights connected with Philip's boyhood and the oast houses to him the most typical feature of the Kentish scene. It was with no sense of strangeness, but as though he were at home, that Philip followed Sally through the long lines of the hops. The sun was bright now and cast a sharp shadow. Philip feasted his eyes on the richness of the green leaves. The hops were yellowing, and to him they had the beauty and the passion which poets in Sicily have found in the purple grape. As they walked along, Philip felt himself overwhelmed by the rich luxuriance. A sweet scent arose from the fat Kentish soil, and the fitful September breeze was heavy with the goodly perfume of the hops. Athelstan felt the exhilaration instinctively, for he lifted up his voice and sang. It was the cracked voice of a boy of fifteen, and Sally turned round. "'You be quiet, Athelstan, or we shall have a thunderstorm.' In a moment they heard the hum of voices, and in a moment more came upon the pickers. They were all hard at work, talking and laughing as they picked. They sat on chairs, on stools, on boxes, with their baskets by their sides, and some stood by the bin throwing the hops they picked straight into it. There were a lot of children about, and a good many babies, some in makeshift cradles, some tucked up in a rug on the soft brown dry earth. The children picked a little and played a great deal. The women worked busily. They had been pickers from childhood, and they could pick twice as fast as foreigners from London. They boasted about the number of bushels they had picked in a day, but they complained you could not make money now as in former times. Then they paid you a shilling for five bushels, but now the rate was eight and even nine bushels to the shilling. In the old days a good picker could earn enough in the season to keep her for the rest of the year, but now there was nothing in it. You got a holiday for nothing, and that was about all. Mrs. Hill had bought herself a piano out of what she made picking, so she said, but she was very near, one wouldn't like to be near like that, and most people thought it was only what she said. If the truth was known, perhaps it would be found that she had put a bit of money from the savings bank towards it. The hoppers were divided into bin companies of ten pickers, not counting children, and Athelny loudly boasted of the day when he would have a company consisting entirely of his own family. Each company had a bin man, whose duty it was to supply it with strings of hops at their bins. The bin was a large sack, on a wooden frame about seven feet high, and long rows of them were placed between the rows of hops, and it was to this position that Athelny aspired when his family was old enough to form a company. Meanwhile, he worked rather by encouraging others than by exertions of his own. He sauntered up to Mrs. Athelny, who had been busy for half an hour and had already emptied a basket into the bin, and with his cigarette between his lips began to pick. He asserted that he was going to pick more than anyone that day but Mother. Of course no one could pick as much as Mother. That reminded him of the trials which Aphrodite put upon the curious psyche and he began to tell his children the story of her love for the unseen bridegroom. He told it very well. It seemed to Philip, listening with a smile on his lips, that the old tale fitted in with the scene. The sky was very blue now, and he thought it could not be more lovely even in Greece. The children with their fair hair and rosy cheeks, strong, healthy, and vivacious, the delicate form of the hops, the challenging emerald of the leaves like a blare of trumpets, the magic of the green alley narrowing to a point as you looked down the row with the pickers in their sunbonnets. Perhaps there was more of the Greek spirit there than you could find in the books of professors or in museums. He was thankful for the beauty of England. He thought of the winding white roads and the hedgerows, the green meadows with their elm trees, the delicate line of the hills and the copses that crowned them, the flatness of the marshes, and the melancholy of the North Sea. He was very glad that he felt its loveliness, but presently Athelny grew restless and announced that he would go and ask how Robert Kemp's mother was. He knew everyone in the garden, 
and called them all by their Christian names. He knew their family histories and all that had happened to them from birth. With harmless vanity he played the fine gentleman among them, and there was a touch of condescension in his familiarity. Philip would not go with him. "'I'm going to earn my dinner,' he said. "'Quite right, my boy,' answered Athelny, with a wave of the hand as he strolled away. "'No work, no dinner.'" End of chapter 118 Chapter 119 Philip had not a basket of his own, but sat with Sally. Jane thought it monstrous that he should help her elder sister rather than herself, and he had to promise to pick for her when Sally's basket was full. Sally was almost as quick as her mother. "'Won't it hurt your hands for sewing?' asked Philip. "'Oh, no, it wants soft hands. That's why women pick better than men. If your hands are hard and your fingers all stiff with a lot of rough work, you can't pick near so well.' He liked to see her deft movements, and she watched him too now and then with that maternal spirit of hers which was so amusing and yet so charming. He was clumsy at first and she laughed at him. When she bent over and showed him how best to deal with a whole line their hands met. He was surprised to see her blush. He could not persuade himself that she was a woman. Because he had known her as a flapper he could not help looking upon her as a child still yet the number of her admirers showed that she was a child no longer, and though they had only been down for a few days one of Sally's cousins was already so attentive that she had to endure a lot of chaffing. His name was Peter Gahn, and he was the son of Mrs. Athelny's sister who had married a farmer near Fern. Everyone knew why he found it necessary to walk through the hop-field every day. A call-off by the sounding of a horn was made for breakfast at eight, and though Mrs. Athelny told them they had not deserved it, they ate it very heartily. They set to work again and worked till twelve, when the horn sounded once more for dinner. At intervals the measurer went his round from bin to bin, accompanied by the booker who entered first in his own book and then in the hoppers the number of bushels picked. As each bin was filled it was measured out in bushel baskets into a huge bag called a poke and this the measurer and the pole-puller carried off between them and put on the wagon. Athelny came back now and then with stories of how much Mrs. Heath or Mrs. Jones had picked, and he conjured his family to beat her. He was always wanting to make records, and sometimes in his enthusiasm picked steadily for an hour. His chief amusement in it, however, was that it showed the beauty of his graceful hands, of which he was excessively proud. He spent much time manicuring them. He told Philip, as he stretched out his tapering fingers, that the Spanish grandees had always slept in oiled gloves to preserve their whiteness. The hand that wrung the throat of Europe, he remarked dramatically, was as shapely and exquisite as a woman's. And he looked at his own as he delicately picked the hops and sighed with self-satisfaction. When he grew tired of this he rolled himself a cigarette and discourse to Philip of art and literature. In the afternoon it grew very hot. Work did not proceed so actively, and conversation halted. The incessant chatter of the morning dwindled now to desultory remarks. Tiny beads of sweat stood on Sally's upper lip, and as she worked her lips were slightly parted. She was like a rosebud bursting into flower. Falling off time depended on the state of the oast house. Sometimes it was filled early, and as many hops had been picked by three or four as could be dried during the night. Then work was stopped. But generally the last measuring of the day began at five. As each company had its bin measured it gathered up its things and, chatting again now that work was over, sauntered out of the garden. The women went back to the huts to clean up and prepare the supper, while a good many of the men strolled down the road to the public house. A glass of beer was very pleasant after the day's work. The Athelny's bin was the last to be dealt with. When the measurer came Mrs. Athelny, with a sigh of relief, stood up and stretched her arms. She had been sitting in the same position for many hours and was stiff. "'Now let's go to the jolly sailor,' said Athelny. "'The rites of the day must be duly performed, and there is none more sacred than that.' "'Take a jug with you, Athelny,' said his wife and bring back a pint and a half for supper. She gave him the money, copper by copper. The bar-parlour was already well filled. 
It had a sanded floor, benches round it, and yellow pictures of Victorian prize-fighters on the walls. The licensee knew all his customers by name, and he leaned over his bar smiling benignly at two young men who were throwing rings on a stick that stood up from the floor. Their failure was greeted with a good deal of hearty chaff from the rest of the company. Room was made for the new arrivals. Philip found himself sitting between an old laborer in corduroys with string tied under his knees and a shiny-faced lad of seventeen with a love-lock neatly plastered on his red forehead. Athelny insisted on trying his hand at the throwing of rings. He backed himself for half a pint and won it. As he drank the loser's health, he said, "'I would sooner have won this than won the derby, my boy.' He was an outlandish figure, with his wide-brimmed hat and pointed beard, among those country folk, and it was easy to see that they thought him very queer. But his spirits were so high, his enthusiasm so contagious, that it was impossible not to like him. Conversation went easily. A certain number of pleasantries were exchanged in the broad, slow accent of the Isle of Thanet, and there was uproarious laughter at the sallies of the local wag a pleasant gathering. It would have been a hard-hearted fellow who did not feel a glow of satisfaction in his fellows. Philip's eyes wandered out of the window where it was bright and sunny still. There were little white curtains in it tied up with red ribbon like those of a cottage window, and on the sill were pots of geraniums. In due course, one by one, the idlers got up and sauntered back to the meadow where supper was cooking. "'I expect you'll be ready for your bed,' said Mrs. Athelny to Philip. You're not used to getting up at five and staying in the open air all day. You're coming to bathe with us, Uncle Phil, aren't you? the boys cried. Rather. He was tired and happy. After supper, balancing himself against the wall of the hut on a chair without a back, he smoked his pipe and looked at the night. Sally was busy. She passed in and out of the hut, and he lazily watched her methodical actions. Her walk attracted his notice. It was not particularly graceful, but it was easy and assured. She swung her legs from the hips, and her feet seemed to tread the earth with decision. Athelny had gone off to gossip with one of the neighbors, and presently Philip heard his wife address the world in general. "'There now, I'm out of tea, and I wanted Athelny to go down to Mrs. Black's and get some.' A pause, and then her voice was raised. "'Sally, just run down to Mrs. Black's and get me half a pound of tea, will you? I've run quite out of it. All right, mother. Mrs. Black had a cottage about half a mile along the road, and she combined the office of postmistress with that of universal provider. Sally came out of the hut, turning down her sleeves. Shall I come with you, Sally? asked Philip. Don't you trouble. I'm not afraid to go alone. I didn't think you were, but it's getting near my bedtime, and I was just thinking I'd like to stretch my legs. Sally did not answer, and they set out together. The road was white and silent. There was not a sound in the summer night. They did not speak much. "'It's quite hot even now, isn't it?' said Philip. "'I think it's wonderful for the time of year.' But their silence did not seem awkward. They found it was pleasant to walk side by side, and felt no need of words. Suddenly, at a stile in the hedgerow, they heard a low murmur of voices, and in the darkness they saw the outline of two people. They were sitting very close to one another, and did not move as Philip and Sally passed. "'I wonder who that was,' said Sally. "'They looked happy enough, didn't they? I expect they took us for lovers, too.' They saw the light of the cottage in front of them, and in a minute went into the little shop. The glare dazzled them for a moment. "'You are late,' said Mrs. Black. "'I was just going to shut up.' She looked at the clock, getting on for nine. Sally asked for her half-pound of tea. Mrs. Athelny could never bring herself to buy more than half a pound at a time. And they set off up the road again. Now and then some beast of the night made a short, sharp sound, but it seemed only to make the silence more marked. "'I believe if you stood still you could hear the sea,' said Sally. They strained their ears and their fancy presented them with a faint sound of little waves lapping up against the shingle. When they passed the stile again the lovers were still there, but now they were not speaking. They were in one another's arms, and the man's lips were pressed against the girl's. 
"'They seem busy,' said Sally. They turned a corner, and a breath of warm wind beat for a moment against their faces. The earth gave forth its freshness. There was something strange in the tremulous night, and something you knew not what seemed to be waiting. The silence was on a sudden pregnant with meaning. Philip had a queer feeling in his heart. It seemed very full. It seemed to melt. The hackneyed phrases expressed precisely the curious sensation. He felt happy and anxious and expectant. To his memory came back those lines in which Jessica and Lorenzo murmur melodious words to one another, capping each other's utterance. But passion shines bright and clear through the conceits that amuse them. He did not know what there was in the air that made his senses so strangely alert. It seemed to him that he was pure soul to enjoy the scents and the sounds and the savors of the earth. He had never felt such an exquisite capacity for beauty. He was afraid that Sally by speaking would break the spell, but she said never a word, and he wanted to hear the sound of her voice. Its low richness was the voice of the country night itself. They arrived at the field through which she had to walk to get back to the huts. Philip went in to hold the gate open for her. "'Well, here I think I'll say good night. Thank you for coming all that way with me.' She gave him her hand, and as he took it he said, "'If you were very nice, you'd kiss me good night, like the rest of the family.' "'I don't mind,' she said. Philip had spoken in jest. He merely wanted to kiss her because he was happy, and he liked her, and the night was so lovely. "'Good night, then,' he said, with a little laugh, drawing her towards him. She gave him her lips. They were warm and full and soft. He lingered a little. They were like a flower. Then, he knew not how, without meaning, he flung his arms round her. She yielded quite silently. Her body was firm and strong. He felt her heart beat against his. Then he lost his head. His senses overwhelmed him like a flood of rushing waters. He drew her into the darker shadow of the hedge. End of chapter 119 Chapter 120 Philip slept like a log and awoke with a start to find Harold tickling his face with the feather. There was a shout of delight when he opened his eyes. He was drunken with sleep. "'Come on, lazy bones,' said Jane. "'Sally says she won't wait for you unless you hurry up.' Then he remembered what had happened. His heart sank, and, half out of bed already, he stopped. He did not know how he was going to face her. He was overwhelmed with a sudden rush of self-reproach, and bitterly, bitterly he regretted what he had done. What would she say to him that morning? He dreaded meeting her, and he asked himself how he could have been such a fool. But the children gave him no time. Edward took his bathing drawers and his towel, Athelstan tore the bedclothes away, and in three minutes they all clattered down into the road. Sally gave him a smile. It was as sweet and innocent as it had ever been. "'You do take time to dress yourself,' she said. "'I thought you was never coming.' There was not a particle of difference in her manner. He had expected some change, subtle or abrupt. He fancied that there would be shame in the way she treated him, or anger, or perhaps some increase of familiarity. But there was nothing. She was exactly the same as before. They walked towards the sea all together, talking and laughing, and Sally was quiet, but she was always that, reserved, but he had never seen her otherwise, and gentle. She neither sought conversation with him, nor avoided it. Philip was astounded. He had expected the incident of the night before to have caused some revolution in her, but it was just as though nothing had happened. It might have been a dream, and as he walked along, a little girl holding on to one hand and a little boy to the other, while he chatted as unconcernedly as he could, he sought for an explanation. He wondered whether Sally meant the affair to be forgotten. Perhaps her senses had run away with her just as his had, and, treating what had occurred as an accident due to unusual circumstances, it might be that she had decided to put the matter out of her mind. It was ascribing to her a power of thought and a mature wisdom which fitted neither with her age nor with her character. But he realized that he knew nothing of her. There had been in her always something enigmatic. 
They played leapfrog in the water, and the bath was as uproarious as on the previous day. Sally mothered them all, keeping a watchful eye on them and calling to them when they went out too far. She swam staidly backwards and forwards while the others got up to their larks and now and then turned on her back to float. Presently she went out and began drying herself. She called to the others more or less peremptorily, and at last only Philip was left in the water. He took the opportunity to have a good hard swim. He was more used to the cold water this second morning, and he reveled in its salt freshness. It rejoiced him to use his limbs freely, and he covered the water with long, firm strokes. But Sally, with a towel round her, went down to the water's edge. "'You're to come out this minute, Philip,' she called, as though he were a small boy under her charge. And when, smiling with amusement at her authoritative way, he came towards her, she upbraided him. "'It is naughty of you to stay in so long. Your lips are quite blue, and just look at your teeth. They're chattering. All right, I'll come out. She had never talked to him in that manner before. It was as though what had happened gave her a sort of right over him, and she looked upon him as a child to be cared for. In a few minutes they were dressed, and they started to walk back. Sally noticed his hands. "'Just look, they're quite blue. Oh, it's all right, it's only the circulation. I shall get the blood back in a minute. Give them to me.' She took his hands in hers and rubbed them, first one, and then the other till the color returned. Philip, touched and puzzled, watched her. He could not say anything to her on account of the children, and he did not meet her eyes, but he was sure they did not avoid his purposely. It just happened that they did not meet. And during the day there was nothing in her behavior to suggest a consciousness in her that anything had passed between them. Perhaps she was a little more talkative than usual. When they were all sitting again in the hop-field, she told her mother how naughty Philip had been in not coming out of the water till he was blue with cold. It was incredible, and yet it seemed that the only effect of the incident of the night before was to arouse in her a feeling of protection towards him. She had the same instinctive desire to mother him as she had with regard to her brothers and sisters. It was not till the evening that he found himself alone with her. She was cooking the supper, and Philip was sitting on the grass by the side of the fire. Mrs. Athelny had gone down to the village to do some shopping, and the children were scattered in various pursuits of their own. Philip hesitated to speak. He was very nervous. Sally attended to her business with serene competence, and she accepted placidly the silence which to him was so embarrassing. He did not know how to begin. Sally seldom spoke unless she was spoken to or had something particular to say. At last he could not bear it any longer. "'You're not angry with me, Sally?' he blurted out suddenly. She raised her eyes quietly and looked at him without emotion. "'Me? No. Why should I be?' He was taken aback and did not reply. She took the lid off the pot, stirred the contents, and put it on again. A savory smell spread over the air. She looked at him once more with a quiet smile which barely separated her lips. It was more a smile of the eyes. "'I always liked you,' she said. His heart gave a great thump against his ribs, and he felt the blood rushing to his cheeks. He forced a faint laugh. "'I didn't know that. That's because you're a silly. I don't know why you liked me. I don't either.' She put a little more wood on the fire. I knew I liked you that day when you came when you'd been sleeping out and hadn't had anything to eat. Do you remember? And me and mother, we got Thorpe's bed ready for you. He flushed again, for he did not know that she was aware of that incident. He remembered it himself with horror and shame. That's why I wouldn't have anything to do with the others. You remember that young fellow mother wanted me to have? I let him come to tea because he bothered me so, but I knew I'd say no. Philip was so surprised that he found nothing to say. There was a queer feeling in his heart. He did not know what it was, unless it was happiness. Sally stirred the pot once more. I wish those children would make haste and come. I don't know where they've got to. Supper's ready now. Shall I go and see if I can find them? said Philip. It was a relief to talk about 
practical things. Well, it wouldn't be a bad idea, I must say. There's mother coming. Then, as he got up, she looked at him without embarrassment. Shall I come for a walk with you tonight when I put the children to bed? Yes. Well, you wait for me down by the stile, and I'll come when I'm ready. He waited under the stars, sitting on the stile, and the hedges with their ripening blackberries were high on each side of him. From the earth rose rich scents of the night, and the air was soft and still. His heart was beating madly. He could not understand anything of what happened to him. He associated passion with cries and tears and vehemence, and there was nothing of this in Sally. But he did not know what else but passion could have caused her to give herself. But passion for him? He would not have been surprised if she had fallen to her cousin, Peter Gahn, tall, spare, and straight, with his sunburned face and long, easy stride. Philip wondered what she saw in him. He did not know if she loved him as he reckoned love. And yet he was convinced of her purity. He had a vague inkling that many things had combined, things that she felt though was unconscious of, the intoxication of the air and the hops and the night, the healthy instincts of the natural woman, a tenderness that overflowed, and an affection that had in it something maternal and something sisterly, and she gave all she had to give because her heart was full of charity. He heard a step on the road, and a figure came out of the darkness. Sally, he murmured. She stopped and came to the stile, and with her came sweet, clean odors of the countryside. She seemed to carry with her sense of the new mown hay and the savor of ripe hops and the freshness of young grass. Her lips were soft and full against his, and her lovely strong body was firm within his arms. Milk and honey, he said. You're like milk and honey. He made her close her eyes and kissed her eyelids, first one and then the other. Her arm, strong and muscular, was bare to the elbow. He passed his hand over it and wondered at its beauty. It gleamed in the darkness. She had the skin that Rubens painted, astonishingly fair and transparent, and on one side were little golden hairs. It was the arm of a Saxon goddess, but no immortal had that exquisite homely naturalness, and Philip thought of a cottage garden with the dear flowers which bloom in all men's hearts, of the hollyhock and the red and white rose which is called York and Lancaster, and of love in a mist and sweet William and honeysuckle, larkspur, and London pride. How can you care for me, he said. I'm insignificant and crippled and ordinary and ugly. She took his face in both her hands and kissed his lips. You're an old silly. That's what you are, she said. End of chapter 120. Recording by